All right, so we are ready for the class today. Um, the solution of the recursive homework assignment, I'll send the video to each one of you um, as a solution. Yeah, I still have to record it. Uh, but then we can move on to a new topic today, which has to do with structures. So that's what we're going to do today is mostly talking about structures. And let me <clears throat> get the uh, Canvas page up on the screen so we can you guys can see where we are in the material. <clears throat> and by the way, I also uh, the the um, grade distribution is already sent through announcements. So for anyone who's interested, you can take a look at that. Um, all right, so we are now down to structures. So here is the actual notes on uh, structures and arrays. And there's another one you know, that specifies everything in TTP ASM. And today's lab is going to be, or the lab for today is this one. It only has three points. And then the next one, the homework assignment, where you have to kind of spend about a week to work on, is this homework assignment. It's not, you cannot see it yet, okay? You know, but you will see, okay, might as well just kind of unlock these things first. So that's where we are at at this point. Um, the final exam, I think we have talked about the final exam for this class, haven't we? Okay, I believe so, because I think it's on the calendar. So if you go to the calendar for this whole class, <clears throat> I think it's on it. I don't know why the calendar always takes a long time to load. You mean the topics? Yeah, it's going to be everything after the second exam. Um, so it should be in December. And it's on, I think it's the 12th. So December 12th is the final exam for this class. It starts at 8 a.m., so you might make, want to make a note of that because it's not the usual start time of the class, which is 9 a.m. So the exam starts at 8 a.m., and it lasts until 10 a.m. Um, you know, I cannot make any special accommodation you know, when people come in late you know, in, on that day. Uh, for people who are DSPS, you, know, you can also you know, make arrangements like earlier, so this way, you, know, you can request a room at the DSPS you know, test center and stuff like that. All right. So uh, as far as the scope is concerned, it is everything that we talk about after the second exam or every, all the material that is not included in exam one or exam two. So the next question is, is it going to be comprehensive? The answer is going to be a little bit vague, okay? I'm just going to say it is not intentionally comprehensive, which means you still cannot forget about things about signed versus unsigned. You cannot forget things about the carry flag, the borrow flag, the overflow flag, the sign flag, and the L flag, because those are useful for comparison. And, you know, the test is going to include things related back all the way to, you know, how do you compare signed integers versus unsigned integers. Um, <clears throat> so it's not, uh, and you also need to have a really thorough understanding of the instruction set. Because, you know, guess what? The final exam is going to be in the form of, I give you the C code, I give you faulty assembly code, and your job is to fix it. So you really need to understand the instructions. Not so much how the instruction is done, as in, you know, the pathway within the processor, but you have to, under you have to understand what and the instruction does, okay? So the what becomes much more important than the how when it comes down to the opcodes and the instructions. Um, other than that, you know, you have to know how to compile a program. You know, I give you the C code. You know, how do you convert the control structure into assembly code? That's important. Um, how do we convert a complex expressions into simpler expressions? That becomes important. Um, how we call and return, you know, that's important. How we pass parameters, you know, from a caller to the callee, okay, that's important. How do we return a scalar value? How do we use local variables? So all of those are things that we have already talked about in this class. 
um, today we are kind of introduced the last piece, you know, that is also important in the final exam, and that's structures. Okay, so we're going to talk about structures in today's class. So is that kind of is that answering your question? Okay, very good. <clears throat> All right, so we'll start with a sample program. Okay, we'll start with looking at a particular sample program in C and then in assembly code. So uh, let me take a look. Struct is the one. All right. So I'm not sure. Is that visible? Is that okay for people, you know, in this class, especially those of you who are sitting in the back? Okay, it's readable. Okay. All right. So this is the C code. You know, I make this screen kind of wide because you know, later on I'm going to add the assembly code on the other side. So as far as the C code is concerned, uh, from line three to line eight, we are defining a structure. So what a structure really is, is a template. It is like a class. In fact, the whole concept of a class in C++ can be seen as an extension of the struct uh, language feature in regular C. So do we have any questions about the concept of a struct definition from line three to line eight? No questions? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so in this case, you know, we have three members in the structure. Uh, X, member X, Y, and Z, they're all A-bit unsigned integers. So it's a fairly simple um, structure here. Um, and then we have a subroutine or function in it X. Okay, its only job is you pass a pointer of a structure to init X, and it will initialize you know, each member of the structure with a particular value. So I just put in some random value like five, seven, and one. <clears throat> and you might notice that line 13 has a slightly different syntax, but it really means the same thing. Okay, so line 12, 13, and 14, they all mean about the same thing. The only difference is which member of the structure are we initializing. Okay, but the syntax is different, but they mean the same thing. So when we say, you know, on line 12, when you see PTR points to X equals five, it means we are putting the five, which is the right-hand side of the assignment, to member X of the structure the PTR points to. On line 13, it's basically saying exactly the same thing. Because the first thing we do on line 13 is we dereference PTR, which will give us a structure. Once you have a structure, you can use the dot notation to specify, I don't need the whole structure. I just need one particular member of the structure. That's what a dot is trying to say. So on line 13, it is still saying the same thing as what we have on line 12. It's just a more clumsy way to do that. So in most people's you know, uh, code in C, they prefer you know, the style on line 12 and line 14 instead of the style in line 13. But it is mostly just a, just a stylistic kind of thing and not um, there's no functional difference between line 12 and line 13. Are we still okay so far? Okay, so we're combining the use of pointers and structures, you know, at this point. Okay, so that means, you know, you really have to understand pointers, you know, and remember what pointers we represent. And then now we have main. Uh, main has a local variable, which is an entire structure. So coord or coordinate is actually a struct X. And then we pass the address of coord to init X, and then the you know, main is done. So that's the C code. Um, and the first thing we'll do is, as usual, is to run the C code through the debugger so I can show you a few things that are actually kind of important. So I will exit from here and then go to GDB. And I am recording, so in case somebody is wondering, are we recording? <clears throat> I don't have a particular person in this class you know, who keep you know, asking, are we recording? Um, in my Monday, Wednesday class, you know, we, I have one particular student who always kind of double check, which is helpful. All right, so we GDB struct, <clears throat> which is the name of the, oh, okay, not strict, struct. It's, there we go. And I'm going to put a breakpoint on line 19, okay, which is at the very entry point of main and run the code. Now we're at the very entry point. So the first thing is I want to print what is coord. And you can see that coord has some uninitialized members. Member X is 127 for whatever strange reason. 
y is a zero, and remember z is also a zero. So we don't know exactly why those are the particular value in um, members x, y, and z of cohort. They're just simply uninitialized. Okay. But one thing that we want to examine is where are these members? Okay. And where's the structure itself? So we can now say, tell me where is cohort itself? Okay. This is the address of cohort. And you can see that it is um, ending with uh, F4D, okay, for whatever reason, whatever that is representing. Let me just kind of bump up the font a little bit here. And I need to resize the screen a little bit just so that everything fits. Because I think a larger font can be helpful here. So give me a second to resize the command line window here. There we go. Okay, so we can see how F4D is the address of the entire structure. So now we want to look at the address of each member and see whether it makes sense or not. Okay, so now we look at cohort <clears throat> dot x. Hmm, that's curious, right? Because they are the same. The first byte of the coordinate is also the same address as x, which is the first member of the structure. Does that make sense to you? Kind of makes sense, right? You know, because cohort is basically a collection of a few items, and X, you know, chronologic, not chronological, but in terms of um, the ordering of the definition within struct X, is also the first member. So the first member of a structure having the same address of the entire structure itself seems to make sense. Okay? So you can now probably expect what is the address of y. <clears throat> Turns out it is just one byte after member x. Does that surprise you? No, it should not be too surprising because after all, according to the definition, the ordering of the members you know, in the definition are exactly x, y, z. So when we look at the address of z, okay, we go like, okay, we kind of know where that is going to be. So this is going to be important, okay? Because now we can say, hmm, the offset, okay, of member X from the beginning of the entire structure is zero. The offset of member Y from the beginning of the structure is one. And then the offset of member Z from the beginning of the entire structure is two. Is that okay so far? There's one more thing that is kind of important is how big is cohort? So we can now use the size of operator. Yes, it looks like a function, but it's really called an operator. So we want to look at the size of the entire local variable cord, and it says it's three in terms of bytes. Is that surprising to you that the entire structure is going to take up three bytes? Okay. So this is going to be important later on, you know, because you know, in assembly code, we do not have the concept of a structure. We cannot define a structure the same way that we define a structure in C or C++, but we have other ways to represent the structure inside a struct. Okay, so we'll get to that point. So when we single step here, we get into the function init x, we're passing the pointer ptr, which is the address of cohort in main. And then as we single step, okay, so I'm just single stepping, line 12 is now done. I want to check whether member X of cohort in main is indeed changed to this five or not. Okay, that's one thing I want to check. So now we're going to use the BT thing, okay, because we're going to, we want to look at all the frames that are currently in the program. And then we say, okay, let's switch to frame one, which is main, and then say print cohort.x. It is indeed changed to five already. So that means the subroutine, okay, the function init x, is using the pointer to directly change a member of another function of the caller in this case. Is that okay so far? All right. So now we single step again. You know, we we just initialize y, and now we can initialize z. We go back to main, and at this point, if I print cohort. You can see how x is 5, y is 7, z is 1. Okay, not entirely surprising. Do we have any questions about the C program itself? Let me get out of the debugger and go back into the code. And what I'll do is I'm going to uh, remove the struct.ttpasm, which is something that I did on um, yesterday already. 
So we'll go ahead and write the entire code from scratch today. The C code is already here, but the assembly code is going to be, um, okay, I forgot to display side by side, so give me a second here. <clears throat> Dash uppercase O will make it you know, display side by side. So do we have any questions about the C code? Any questions about why the debugger shows the kind of information that we saw earlier? So we're good here, all right? So now we want to write this entire program using assembly code. So on the right-hand side, okay, you know, we're going to start with the usual stuff, okay? No op, uh, initialize the stack pointer, and then we call main. So to call any function, you have to push the return address. So this is how we push the return address. And then we do a JMPI to the function that we're calling. And when it comes back, we can halt right away because main has no parameters in this case. So now we can write um, the two functions. But before we do that, we have to kind of find a way to represent the struct x thing. So the way it's going to be done is I will define the label x underscore x. In this case, the uppercase x refers to the name of the structure, and then the lowercase x is referring to the name of the member. And it's defined as a zero. So this particular label definition is basically saying x underscore x is a label that defines the number of bytes as an offset between the member x and the beginning of the entire structure. And it's a zero because earlier we saw that the address of chord and the address of chord.x are exactly the same. So are we doing okay so far with line nine, what that label is really representing? Sort of, okay. <clears throat> so when we get to the code, you know, I'll give you another diagram of you know how RAM is being used, and then at that point, hopefully, you know, I can also give you another view, you know, graphically, you know, what x underscore x is representing. Okay. So now we will also define x underscore y, which is the number of bytes between member y and the beginning of the entire structure that it belongs to. So that's going to be x underscore x one plus. So I would like to use relative definitions like this one. So this way, if I have another you know, member like W uh, that is defined before X, I don't have to change line 10 anymore to, because line 10 is only dependent on the fact that Y is following X and X is using only one byte. So the relative definition allows me to have a little bit more stability when I do decide to change the code. I don't have to change a lot more. And then the last one is the size of the entire struct X, which is the offset to the last member of the structure plus the size of the last member of the structure. So in this case, if you're following the definition of the labels, <clears throat> X underscore Y is really just one, X underscore Z is really just two, and then X underscore size is really just three. But the way I define these things allow me to kind of do minimal changes in the future if I so decide to change the structure itself, change how I want to order the items within the structure. So do we have any questions about line 9 to line 12, you know, the, what each one is representing? No questions? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Because, okay, that's a good question. Why do we need to store or why do we need to represent the size? It has to do with, you know, when we have a local variable like chord here, I need to know how many bytes on the stack to reserve for the local variable. So whenever you declare a variable of any kind of a particular structure, you have to know how many bytes do I need to reserve. So that's kind of the purpose of x underscore size is when we have a local variable like this, we need to know how many bytes on the stack to reserve for coord as a local variable. Okay, that's a good question. Any other questions about you know, the program up to this point? Basically, <clears throat> line nine to line 12 here in the assembly code is doing what line three to line eight is doing, are doing in the C code. It's just representing the structure. 
Are we okay at this point? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. All right, so in that case, I'm going to start with main. And, you know, we already know that we have to return from any function. Main is no different from any other function. It still has to return. So I'm going to put in the return code first. LDBD, increment D, S, I mean, JMP D here. Okay, that's all kind of cool. But main also has a local variable there. So I want to look at what the stack is going to look like when main is, when, when the whole frame is set up. Remember what a frame is. A frame is basically a contiguous piece of memory, range of memory locations on the stack where it provides the entire context for a function to operate. So that's going to include all the arguments or all the parameters, if any, the return address, and also any local variable, if there's any. So in this case, <clears throat> because it, there are no parameters, so the return address is going to be the last thing and the only thing that the caller is going to push. And then we have the local variable cord. But in terms of cord, it has three members. So cord.z is going to be here, cord.y is going to be here, and then cord.x is going to be here. When the frame is all set up, the stack pointer should point to the very last byte that was that is reserved, and that would be the same location of where we find the beginning of the entire structure, which is also where we find the first member of the entire structure. So we want the stack to look like this, but it doesn't look like this at this point. What it does look like at this point is from the caller's perspective, this is the last thing that we push. So that means the stack pointer needs to be decremented three times. Okay, so to do that, there are a few ways to do this. You can always do this, right? <clears throat> Just decrement it three times and then increment it three times to deallocate. <clears throat> but this approach is very brittle in the sense that if I change the structure in any way, okay, making it larger, smaller, this may not work anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's not the best way to do it, okay? So I'm going to get rid of this code here. So... As usual, what I'd like to do is to define symbolic names or labels so that I can know where on the stack to find what on the stack. So that means I'm going to say, okay, main chord, okay, this is a label in terms of, it will be defined as the number of bytes of where I can find chord relative to where the stack point is pointing to. So since I do not have any other local variables, this is going to be a zero, okay, because you have to look at this picture here on line 18, how the stack pointer should end up pointing at the beginning of the entire you know, cord. So that means the offset of where I can find cord from where the stack pointer points to should be a zero because it's right there. So this part is pretty easy. <clears throat> now I'm going to introduce a new concept, which is local var size, okay, local var size. I think we might have talked about this already from before. Did I talk about local var size in this class? Nope. Okay. That's okay. So local var size is local variable size. In other words, I am counting all the bytes you know, that I need for every single local variable of a function. So in this case, ah, okay, that's a pretty easy thing to do. It's just three. Okay. In other words, I just need three bytes, okay, as to for all my local variables, because cord is the only local variable of main, and it's going to take up three bytes, okay. But once again, any use of literal constant is not a good idea. So instead of doing this, I'm going to say, give me the last local variable and also the size of the last local variable. I can use a three here, but that means any time I change the structure, this is not going to work because the length, the, the size of the structure may not stay three all the time. So instead of doing this, I'm going to use the label that I defined earlier, which helped to answer the question that you asked earlier, which is why do I want to use a label to represent the size of a structure? Is so that I can do this, you know, I can use it for allocation purposes. Okay, and don't forget the plus here, okay, because we're adding the size of x, you know, struct x, to the offset of where I can find cord, and that becomes the total number of bytes that I need for local variables in this case. 
All right, so I'm just going to pause here and see if there are any questions about the concept of maintaining a label whose only responsibility is to say, okay, I'm here to represent the total number of bytes that we need for all the local variables in a particular function. In this case, it really is just three, but that's the purpose of this label. Any questions about this label definition? Okay. I'm, I'm guessing some of you are asking, so how do we use the label? Now that we have defined the label, how do we use it? Okay, so that, that's a really natural question. So I'm going to answer that question right away. The way we use that label is like this, LDI B um, main local var size. And then we do a subtraction of the stack point of B from D. So this is how we allocate for all the local variables. So regardless of how many bytes we need, so typically before we just go like, oh, okay, we have one single decrement D for to reserve one byte, or we have two decrement D to reserve two bytes. Now we make it much more general because now no matter how many bytes you need, we just need those two instructions, line 23 and line 24, to reserve <clears throat> enough bytes on the stack for all the local variables. But if you have allocation, you have to think about the allocation. Local variables are deallocated by the subroutine itself, which means before we get out of the subroutine, before we return, we also have to remember to deallocate, which is basically just adding three back to the stack pointer. So it goes back to where it was in order to find the return address. Okay. <clears throat> so do we have any questions about line 23, line 24, and the matching line 26 and line 27? You know, the purposes of those lines. Okay. Are there any questions asking why do we have line 21 and then we also have line 23, line 24, as well as line 26 and line 27? The label definition does not do a single thing about the stack pointer itself. It is just a label, which is a symbolic name for a particular integer value. That's all the label is. But we really need to adjust the stack pointer, decrease it by three bytes, you know, and that can only be done at runtime using line 23 and line 24. To reverse it, okay, to deallocate those the same three bytes would be the job of line 26 and line 27. <clears throat> it cannot be done using just label definition. Label definition is not a runtime thing, it is an assemble time thing, which means only the assembler knows, you know, oh, okay, main local var size is a three, but it doesn't know what to do with that value of three. So I'm gonna pause and just kinda make sure that we got this part understood. Yep, go ahead. Line 9 to line 12, <clears throat> it's defining, okay, so if you think about a, a struct definition, it is a cookie cutter. It is not a cookie, okay? Um, I mean, that's important, okay? So where is our cookie? How do we create, how do we stamp out that cookie using the cookie cutter? That's the job of line 20 and line 21. Sorry, no, I take it back. Line 23 and line 24. So lines 23 and line 24 is where we take the cookie cutter and go like on the cookie dough, and now you have a piece of cookie which lives on the stack, okay? And then line 26 and line 27 is recycling the cookie. <laughs> it's like, okay, this cookie or the whatever cookie dough is used for this cookie is now not useful anymore, and we are putting it back into the large clump of cookie dough for making other things later on. Is that okay? So in the C code, it is the same thing. Line three to line eight in the C code is defining the cookie cutter. Okay, it's basically just a thing that has a shape on it, and it will determine how much cookie dough you will need for that cookie. But we don't have a cookie, okay? Line three to line eight in the C code does not make a cookie. It makes a cookie cutter. 
when we get to line 19 in the C code, that's when we say, okay, we are going to make a cookie, but what, what shape do we want it? Or which cookie cutter am I supposed to use? The cookie cutter called X, okay? So X is the identifier of the cookie cutter itself. So we are using this cookie cutter to cut out a piece of cookie and the name of the cookie is coord. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> And of course, at the end of today's class, most people just remember that it has something to do with cookies and cookie cutters. <laughs> but I don't, I'm not re remembering which one is which one. So, all right. So here we have the code. Um, I'm going to, um, if you're writing this code, okay, if you're just experimenting, you know, I would put a halt instruction right here, okay, just to take a look at what does the stack look like? Okay, where's the stack pointer? And what location is being used for what? Okay, so I would do it like this. So let me put out, <clears throat> let me use the, uh, the tablet to kind of show you a pictorial representation of everything that is <clears throat> shown here. That's gonna take a little bit of time because the tablet needs to boot and stuff like that. Shouldn't take too long. <clears throat> so while the tablet is booting up, I'm going to, oh, okay, it's almost, yeah, it's still being done. <clears throat> so on line 20 of the C code, we are passing the address of cord to initx. So can I, I'll ask you, how many bytes do we need for that argument? Go ahead. Oh, okay, I thought you had a question. Okay, so let me ask the question again, okay? Line 20 in the C code, it has in one single argument, which is the address of cord. If I were to translate that into assembly code, how many bytes am I pushing just for the argument itself? One, very good, okay, because we are passing the address, and the address of anything in TTP is one byte. So even though the structure itself has three bytes, we're only passing the address of the first byte, the address of a byte is a byte, the address of an entire structure is also just a byte, okay? <clears throat> okay, now that I got the tablet up and running, I'm gonna show you a picture. So let me navigate to the Tuesday, Thursday class, start a new notepad. And then I have to start up the, uh, the viewer on this side. So scrcpy.sh, there we go. <clears throat> All right, so we want to anticipate what is the, what the program is doing or how it is using the stack. And so we're gonna draw a picture here, okay? This location, which is corresponding to uh, FF in hexadecimal, is going to be used to, sto to store the return address from main back to the entry code. The entry code itself has no name, so we're just gonna say this is a return address, okay? The next three locations are reserved on the stack. They don't have any particular value. They are uninitialized at this point. So that will correspond to FE, FD, and FC. This is the beginning of the entire structure. So that's gonna make it coord.x. This is coord.y. This is coord.z. And the stack pointer, after we do all the allocation, should point to location FC. But those locations, those three locations, remain uninitialized at this point because all we did was to decrement or decrease the stack pointer by three, but we did not bother to put anything into those locations or not yet. So are we good so far in terms of what the stack should look like at this point? <clears throat> and this entire thing, okay, these four bytes together, is the frame of calling main from the entry code of the entire program. This is called the frame because it provides the context for main to function. All right, so let's go back to the program. <clears throat> and we want to run the entire code with a halt instruction on line 26, just as it has it now. So let's go ahead and run this. And I need to make sure that I save the program first. I used the wrong key to save it. 
There we go. And now we can run it. Submit um, temp struct dot ttp asm. So if you have not set up to use your reverse spider yet, you probably want to do it as soon as possible because without your know, uh, reverse spider, you can still get the homework done. It's just going to be a lot more tedious. So this can help save you a lot of time. All right, so we switch back to the assembler and then we want to look at what is happening on the stack and what is happening to the register, especially the stack corner. So this is the entire trace. We start with a no up, okay? It doesn't do a single thing, but it has to be there because of the simulator. Um, LDD0, which really does not do a single, single thing because all registers start with zero to begin with, but I need it to be here just so that we can say, okay, we initialize the stack corner. <clears throat> this is putting a nine into register A, which is the return address, and then we push it on the stack. So line four or five here, we'll push it on the stack. So now the stack has the top of the stack now has a value of zero nine because that's the return address. <clears throat> and then we have a JMPI to main to continue execution at the function. So the next one is going to be in main, which is zero A. <clears throat> so inside main, the first thing we do is we load B with the total number of bytes that we need to reserve. That's three. And then we subtract that three from the stack pointer. So now the stack pointer is pointing to location FC. And that's the end of this whole thing because I put a halt instruction in the middle of main. <clears throat> All right, so we now compare what we are seeing here with uh, this diagram and it matches. Is that okay? So every step along the way, I'm you know, basically double checking things, you know, understanding what the stack is supposed to look like before we proceed any further. All right, so now that part is done, we can now proceed to translate the additional part of the C code into assembly code. <clears throat> All right, so what we do is we take out a halt instruction and then we start to say, okay, now what do we do? We have to calculate the address of cord and then push it on the stack because it is the argument. So now we say, hmm, how do we get it? Probably have something to do with getting a main cord, which is the offset from where the stack pointer points to, to the thing that I want to access. Add BD, now we have the address of that thing. And that's all we need. I don't need an LD here because all I really need is the address of cord. And on line 27 right now, register B has the address of cord, which is what I need to push on the stack. So let's push it on the stack, which is a decrement D followed by STDB in this case. So we have just pushed uh, the address of cord on the stack. Now we have to push the return address because every time you call a function, you have to push the return address. So we have the uh, increment D, STDA in this case. And now we can finally go to the function, which is init X. When it comes back, we need an increment D to deallocate the argument, which is the address of cord. And that should be everything I need to do in main. So now we have to write the function, which is init X. Okay. And as usual, the first thing I do is I will simply write the exit or the return code, which is LDBD, increment D, JMPB, like that. <clears throat> but before I write anything inside init X, I'm going to say, let's halt, okay? Let's find out what is really pushed on the stack. From the perspective of init X, uh, what is on the stack, and, <clears throat> and then we also, I can also put in a, two lines of comment here because the, the top thing I can expect on the stack is the parameter, which is PTR, which is pushed first by the caller. And then the caller is also going to push the return address and the stack pointer should be pointing to the last thing being pushed, which is the return address. So at the halt instruction, this is what I'm expecting from the perspective of the function init X. Okay, so save the code, control, I mean, colon W and then go back to um, River Spider, <clears throat> and we are gonna run the program again and look at the trace again. So this time we are expecting some minor changes compared to last time, because this time we're gonna have <clears throat> the parameter push on the stack or the argument push on the stack from main, 
which is the address of coord, which we already know is supposed to be FC. So FB, location FB, should have a value of FC. And then we have another return address here. This one is supposed to be used so that init X can return to main. So this is going to take up location FA. And then the stack pointer, <clears throat> which is here, oh, okay. Ah, okay, that still works, is going to move all the way down here <clears throat> for this code to work. All right. So now that I know what I should be expecting when the program runs, I can now look at the trace and see whether that is what I'm seeing. So this is the way that you should probably write, use, this is the method that you should use to write your program for um, the upcoming homework assignment. You have once again a week to work on it, and this time we don't have a winter, I mean uh, Thanksgiving break in between, so that means you really get a solid you know, week to work on this one. <clears throat> but before we go any further, this is what we are supposed to be seeing. I'm gonna put it all the way to this side, and then we switch back to the assembler, Go to the analysis tab, and then just kind of scroll down to about here, and then we go back to the picture, and we can now see that you know, in addition to all the things that we did earlier, location FB is now changed to FC, and that is correct, okay, according to what we expected the program to do, because that is the address of cohort, okay, we push it on the stack in main in order for that to become a parameter from the perspective of init x. And then we also push one more thing, which is one C on the stack. <clears throat> and that's going to be, oh, that doesn't look right to me. That does not look right. So I think I messed up the program because I, this is supposed to be a FA and not a FC. Okay, so this is, a, this is an important point in, my, in, in this demonstration because I spotted a difference between the logged behavior of the program and what I think it should be doing. Because the picture on the right-hand side says you know, FA should get a value, it is the return address, but in the trace, <clears throat> FC is getting a value. It is not one location lower, it is one location higher. This is also when the trace itself can tell you where the problem is. Because the stack pointer got incremented instead of decremented. Is that okay? So now I can look at this line here, and I know exactly where to find it. It's line 40. So that is super helpful, because now I can go to line 40 in the editor and go like, yep, we know exactly why the program didn't, you know, it's not, the, it's not working the way it's supposed to, because on line 40, instead of a decrement here, I had an increment. So yes, I did mess up, but I caught the mistake really quickly as well, because I was able to figure out what it is supposed to be doing and compare that to what the program actually was doing. And that difference gives me the ability to go like, oh, it's not doing what it's supposed to. We're supposed to be decrementing the, the stack pointer and instead it's incrementing. Where's the increment instruction? Which line should I change? And I can spot that really quickly. So do we have any questions of what bug I introduced in the program, actually accidentally, because as much as you think this is all rehearsed, it is not. I don't do rehearsal. That's not the kind of thing that I do. But do, are we understanding the process, okay? Because I'm illustrating two things at the same time. One is how do we use structures, okay, which is the main <clears throat> content of today's class. But I'm also illustrating how to write your program and debug your program along the way. Do not write a lot of code before you test it. Before you test it, understand what the program is supposed to do first, okay? All right, so now that I have quote unquote fixed the program, I'm gonna run it again, just because <clears throat> with the tool, it's not too much trouble to have to run it again. I just wanna confirm that, okay, everything looks right now. So we'll go ahead and run it again. <clears throat> and then switch back to the analysis tab. And now we have you know, location FA being changed to 1C, 
And we also want to double check that 1C is the right return address. So that is the job of the assemble tab, because now we can look, go to um, the main code, <clears throat> look at a call right here, and then this is actually loading F1C into register A. So 1C is the correct return address. You can also see that your know, 1C is exactly the one byte after the JMPI instruction, which is where a function should return to, which is you know, right after the JMPI. So now we know that in the analysis tab, writing this 1C, overwriting location FA with 1C is what's the right thing to do. Okay, so this is important. You know, this is a really important technique of writing a program is you debug it along the way. You do not just write the entire thing and cross your fingers and hope that it works. Because I can guarantee you, if it's worth writing, it is not going to work. The only kind of program will work the first time are the kind of programs that are not worth writing to begin with. And you can quote me on that. In all your future classes, you can quote me on that one single statement. If the program is worth writing, it's not gonna work the first time. Almost guaranteed. <clears throat> All right, so where are we now? We are now at the entry point of initx. We got everything done up to <clears throat> here, okay? So now we take out the halt instruction and go like, okay, now we have to do the first statement, okay? Now the three statements in <clears throat> initx, they are pretty much the same thing, so if we can get the first one done, we should be fairly confident that we can get the other two done too. So the first thing we need to do is to, I usually do is to evaluate the right-hand side. Okay, that's fine, LDI A with five. Okay, that's our right-hand side. The left-hand side is a little bit obscure this time. Okay, so once again, you know, the most important part about line 12 in the C code is how do you say it in C, okay? Some people just say, oh, it's PTRX, okay? PTR pulse X. But what does that mean exactly? That means member X of the structure that PTR points to, okay? I know it is a little bit long, okay? But you have to describe a particular expression exactly what it is, okay? You know, so you have to be very exact in your language. It's member X of the structure that PTR points to. So in order to get there, it would appear to me the first thing we need to get to is PTR, the pointer itself, okay? So <clears throat> we have already written enough code to kind of have this usual template thing, which is you'll put the offset into B, okay? This is, um, okay, I have to define the offset first, sorry, I forgot about that. So init x underscore return address is a zero because we don't have any local variables in this case. And then init x underscore PTR, is one byte after that because the return address takes up one byte on the stack. So I like to define everything in a relative term. Now, whether you are gonna do this in your code or not, that's up to you, okay? So how you want to define the labels is up to you. <clears throat> so now that we have the labels, I can use the label, which is init x underscore PTR, which is the offset of where I can find pointer from relative to where the pointer is pointing to relative to where the stack pointer is pointing to. Okay, I have to be extra clear about that one. So when you add the stack pointer to the offset, now you have the actual address of pointer. The address of pointer is not even close to what I need, okay? Because I need pointer itself as a value. So I'm gonna use the LDBB here. So now register B has pointer, okay? Which is by itself an address of a structure. Then I look at line 13 and 14 also, it's like, hmm, it looks like both of those will also need to use pointer. If I can save the value of register B and not mess around with that, I might want to keep it around, okay? So I'm going to keep register B as pointer, as PTR, and then I'm going to use register C to calculate the address of member X of the structure the PTR is pointing to. So to do that, I load C with the offset of member X from the beginning of a structure, which is just X underscore X in this case, and then add B to C, because the intention is not to change register B, so I'm just gonna use register C. So line 25 and line 26 is something new 
that I'm that we're introducing today, because that says if I know where to find the beginning of a structure by adding the offset to a particular member, I now can calculate the address of a member in the structure. Is that part okay? Maybe, okay. So when we run the code, okay, and we take a look at what is on the stack, you know, using the picture, I think that will help. <clears throat> so now that we have register C being the address of member X of the structure the PTR is pointing to, we can now say, oh, okay, we'll just kind of store to that location, whatever is on the right-hand side. And once again, I'm not commenting this code because I'm leaving that up to you. Okay, it is a very important process of this class, okay, is to look at the code that I wrote in class and be able to comment and explain what each line is doing. And you can explain that by telling, you know, by commenting what each register has, you know, after that line executes. So verbally, okay, I have just, you know, spoken, you know, what each register has after each line in the assembly code. So when you go through the recording again, you can pause and then absorb that information and then use your own words to describe what is in a register after a line. That is my recommendation, okay? It is not something that I'm gonna force you guys to do because at the end of the semester, it is not my grade. But I would try my best to get you guys to get the best grade that you can get. But I will make recommendations, but whether people follow the recommendation or not is up to you. Okay? So I'm, I'm really trying my best, okay, to give you guys you know, some guidance of how, what you can do to understand all this material. Okay, so right now, I'm gonna put a halt here again, okay, which, which basically means, okay, let's figure out what this is gonna do, what the stack is gonna look like, and how do we make sense of what is happening up to this point? <clears throat> so save the code, go back to TTP, I mean, uh, Ripple Spider, and just let it run again. And then we'll go take a look at both the trace and also the picture of what is on the stack. So this way I can actually give you a more pictorial representation of what is going on. So the program is done, go back to the trace, we got some additional stuff happening. <clears throat> so we are, so we can trace, you know, starting from here, okay? This is the return address. And then we take a look at the picture that is here. And let me move the picture a little bit to the left so I have more space to kind of draw some additional stuff, okay? So in terms of the frame, we now have two frames. <clears throat> the frame for init X is using location FB and also FA, but we have a pointer, okay? Because PTR or, you know, is location FB, so this is basically a pointer to the beginning of a structure. That's PTR, that's pointer, from the perspective of the function init X. <clears throat> so now the question is, what about those labels, you know, those crazy labels that we defined earlier? What are those things and what are they representing in this case? So let me <clears throat> move things around a little bit just so that I have the space to do that documentation. So I'm gonna move all this stuff all the way here. And now we can you know, start to look into what are those labels? So this label here, okay, to from here to here, which is a zero, this is defining um, init x underscore return address, which is basically just a zero. From here, okay, let me see what I can do here. Oh, okay, maybe a different color would help in this case. Okay, I'm gonna pick blue. <clears throat> so the blue is representing from the same point, which is where the stack pointer points to, to here. This is init x underscore ptr. It is the offset between pointer PTR and where the stack pointer points to. Is that okay? 
What about the x underscore x, x underscore y, and so on? Let me pick a different color again. So this time we'll, we can pick uh, <clears throat> something annoying, you know, like super bright, like so. So when you look at this byte here, okay, this zero here, this is x underscore x. When you look at this here, this is our x underscore y. And when you look at this place versus this place here, this is our x underscore z. They are basically representing the offset, the number of bytes between where something is, and in this case, the beginning of the entire structure. So we have two different types of offsets. One type of offset is relative to where the stack pointer points to. So that would be the names with a function name, underscore, and then the name of the parameter or the local variable. Those are relative to where the stack pointer points to. And then we have the other type of offset, which is x underscore something. That is relative to the beginning of a structure, of where we can find a certain member of that structure. So is that okay? Does that kind of help to help you understand what those labels are trying to represent? Yes, hopefully. Maybe it takes a little bit more time to sink in, okay? <clears throat> All right, but from the code perspective, you can also use that to help you understand what we are doing here. So if I were to switch back to the code <clears throat> and go to line, uh, 22, because line 22 is the beginning of how we calculate the address of member X of the structure that PTR points to. So let's start with line 22. We go back to the trace, and when you're in the trace, you can also see the line numbers. So that means you know, we are looking at row 33 to focus on you know, the new code that we have just you know, inserted into this program. So the first thing it does is to say, Give me the offset of where I can find PTR pointer relative to where the stack pointer points to. That offset is one. Is that what we're expecting? Let's take a look at the map here. The stack pointer is pointing to the return address and to get to PTR, yep, that's one byte off, okay? So that one is that one byte off, which is init x underscore PTR. We put that offset into register B, okay, and then we add to it the stack pointer. So that makes that makes the that makes um, register B pointing to this location by the time we are done with line 23. And then what do we do? Well, we go like, well, now that we have the address of PTR, <clears throat> we want to get to PTR itself, which is the FC content at location FB. So that's why we do a LDBB on line 24, because that is just going to like, okay, register B is pointing here, but that's not ultimately what I need. I need what is at that location. So the LDBB gives me the content at location FB, and that turns out to be FC, which is the pointer to the beginning of the entire structure that I'm supposed to access. So by the time I'm done with line 24, I have the address of the structure in register B. Okay, that's kind of cool, but that's also not ultimately what I really need because I need to change member X of that structure. So now on line 25, I load the offset of member X from the beginning of a struct X, which turns out to be zero, okay? Because it is a, the beginning of a structure is also where you find the first member of the structure and X turns out to be the first member of that structure. So I put that zero as an offset into register C in this case, because that's why register C got changed to a zero. And then I add that offset, um, okay, I calculate the sum between that offset and the address of the structure itself, so I get to the address of the member. So this FC here is actually representing the address of member X of the structure that PTR is pointing to, which is finally what I exactly need in order for the store to happen. So when I do a store, I'm storing to location FC, which according to this map here, is corresponding to member X of the local variable cord that is owned by main. All right, so I'm gonna, yeah, go ahead. 
<clears throat> because I want to be lazy. Because you know, once I have PTR in register B, I can reuse it for the next two statements in C. Okay, in the C code, I should say, because you know, we have register C and then we have the C code, so I have to be a little bit more specific. Okay, but I'll be okay at this point of how I changed member X of the local variable chord of main in the function init x through the parameter pointer. Is that okay? All right, okay. So when you're studying, there are three pieces, at least three pieces of information that you should probably be look at at the same time. It kind of depends on the way you think and the way you learn, okay? But there are up to, there are at least three pieces. The first one is the assembly code, the actual code that describes what we should do, okay? The second piece is the diagram of what should be on the stack. And then the third piece is the actual trace, which shows you exactly what each register has after a certain instruction executes. So you can comment on every single one of these pieces. You can have your own picture, you can comment the original C code. And you know, for this part here, I wouldn't save the document just yet because I'm not quite done with it. But once I'm done with it, you make a copy of the entire spreadsheet, and then you can use column H, I, J, K, and whatever to document the entire trace and help to explain what is going on, how does that have anything to do with what we have talked about in class. Is it because of a caller callie agreement? Is it because of a caller only kind of thing which has to do with local variables? Or does it have to do with how we access members of a structure? So you can you know, write your document over here to basically say, okay, this has to do with structure. This has to do with the caller callie agreement. And this has to do with the use of local variables, okay? All right, so now that we got this part done, it's verified, everything seems to be good. I can now continue with the program. And the rest is relatively easy because I still want to rely on register B as pointer. So the only thing I have to do is to reload C with you know, the offset to Y, <clears throat> add CB again, because B is not changed, and then do a LDIA with whatever seven in this case, and then STCA, and then do about the same thing. Okay, this time we change C to the offset to um, member Z add CB again, so the register C once again become the address of the member of the member Z of the structure that pointer is pointing to, and then LDIA with one this time, STCA. So that should complete the entire program. I'm gonna remove the uh, halt instruction here so that you know, I can actually watch the entire program execute to the end. All right, it is saved. We go to Reaper Spider, run it again, <clears throat> but as it's doing this, I can go back to the diagram here and expect that we should see a five here, a seven here, and a one here, because that's what the C code would have done. Now we switch back to the assembly code, like so, and, oh, we actually can go to the trace right away. So FC is zero five, FD is zero seven, and then FE is zero one. <clears throat> we observe how the stack is unwinding until it's completely balanced, and we get to the halt instruction that we're supposed to get back to. So that concludes the entire program. So now you can make a copy if you want to. So I would make a copy of this code, of this entire assembler, and use it as a resource for studying. <clears throat> This is also going to give you a tremendous amount of hints of how to do the homework assignment. So I'm gonna describe the homework assignment next. But before we do that, I'm gonna give you guys some time to kind of sign in, make a copy of this assembler, you know, so that you have this entire thing. Now, if you don't make a copy, it's not the end of the world because I'm gonna give you the code anyway. So I'm, I'm gonna give you struct.ttpasm so you can reconstruct a trace you know, if you have Reaper Spider already configured to work.
And I'm gonna have to say, you know, this is this tool, okay? This analysis tab is not usual, okay? <clears throat> when you do assembly language programming with any other college, you know, they will give you the assembler, and at the best, they will give you something like GDB to debug your program. GDB is a great tool. You can set up breakpoints, you can look at the registers at any time you want to. But if you don't set up a breakpoint, it's just going to run without letting you what happened in between you know, those breakpoints you know, um, triggering, which means you don't get the full trace. You don't get something like column F and column G like we do here. Because column F, column G, and along with everything else is telling you exactly what is happening when this entire program executes. You don't have to set up a breakpoint. It automatically tracks the execution of every single instruction along with the side effects of every single instruction as well. So this tool is unique to this class because, well, guess what? I wrote it, but I wrote it for a reason because this gives you the complete view of what is happening when your program executes. It gives you the ability to go to each line and understand the effect of each instruction and try to relate it back to the concepts that we are trying to teach in this class. So how we how you utilize the tool is up to you, but I'm explaining that this tool has this specific purpose when I made it. <clears throat> All right, cool. And we got a platypus, a hyena, and a kangaroo. Um, if you sign if you are not signed in, you know, using a certain uh, identity, I don't think you can make a copy of this spreadsheet. You might be able to save it. I'm not sure about that. Okay, so you might be able to save it, but I don't think you can save it in a way that will that's functional. So you know, <clears throat> I would still sign in with a real identity and make a copy, because otherwise, without an actual Google identity, it cannot make a copy because it doesn't know where to make a copy to. So just saying. All right, so. This is all done. I'm going to leave the assembler alone for those people who did not sign in with an identity to make a copy so they can decide to change their mind later. Okay. So instead of doing this, I'm now switching to the new homework assignment. We got about 10 minutes to talk about it, which is more than enough time. All right. So with this program, on the left-hand side, you have the C code. You do not have to write the C code. It's already done. On the right-hand side is the template. The only thing you have to do is to basically specify how traverse is going to be written. This is traverse in C. This is where you're going to put your code. I put a single halt instruction here <clears throat> just so that you know, for those of you who just want to experiment, you can now say, okay, at this halt instruction, what am I supposed to be seeing on the stack? So we take a quick look at this you know, program. We look at how node as a structure is defined. The first member is L, which stands for left-hand side, <clears throat> is a pointer to a struct node, and it's being defined inside the definition of struct node itself. Does that sound dubious to you? Okay, nobody seems to have any idea or any opinion. Because if I were, if this is the first time I see this kind of code, I go, I would frown at it and go like, how can we def how can we use struct node in the middle of a definition of struct node itself? Isn't that something like you're pulling the rug under yourself, or you know, this is a loop that cannot be resolved? Well, as it turns out, if I don't have this asterisk here, you know, in front of the L, it would have been a problem because I wouldn't know what a struct node looks like in the middle of a definition of a struct node. But there's a little asterisk here. What does that mean? What is the significance of that asterisk? Pointer, okay, it's a pointer too. And can someone tell me, without even knowing what a struct node looks like, what is the size of a pointer to a struct node in TTP? One byte, okay? Oh, okay, so that means all this is doing on line five is to say, oh, this is the address of something. It all addresses have the same width, depending on the architecture. <clears throat> if you're using the you know, typical architecture, which is 64-bit, you have a 64-bit pointer. 
But when you're looking at the assembly code on this side, then it has a size of, you know, one byte. Um, and I think I forgot to define the struct node here. Okay, so I'm going to define it so that you don't have to do it. So this is at the beginning of the entire structure. It has an offset of zero. And then value is the next thing. So it is node underscore L one plus. This one is important. This one is referring to the size of a pointer, which is only one byte in TTP. A pointer to a byte is one byte. The point, a pointer to a structure is also one byte. Every pointer is one byte in TTP. <clears throat> and then after that, we have node R, which is the thing that we define after the value. And value is itself also just one byte because it is an unsigned A bit integer. And now we can define the size, which is the offset to find the last member plus the size of the last member. So now we have our definition corresponding to the struct node definition in the C code. So are we doing okay so far, you know, in terms of the definition of struct node itself? So one, two of those members are pointers to struct nodes. Now, are they pointing back to the same struct node? Are they pointing to some other struct node? We don't know. I mean, it's up to the code to decide. So now we have traverse as a, sub, as a function that you're supposed to implement. It has two parameters. So the first thing you have to remember is how are those things ordered on the stack? I'm not going to say anything because you should know it by now, okay? So are we pushing array first or are we going to push PTR first, okay? So that is kind of important for you to remember. <clears throat> and then the next thing now we have to do is to say, oh, the entire thing has one single conditional statement. If PTR is null, we have nothing to do. If PTR is not null, then we have all this stuff to do. So before you go any further, how would you test this program? What is the first, what is the first thing you're going to do when you're about to implement Traverse? How do you approach this programming assignment? Well, I can tell you what I would do, okay? So if I were doing this program, I would take, I would put a halt instruction, run the code, let it all the way, go all the way to the halt instruction, and then check, create myself a map, okay? <clears throat> like this. And then you'll know, check everything is in place, okay? Where is the stack pointer point to at the halt instruction? Is it pointing to the right place? What are those other things that I have pushed on the stack already? Where's the return address so that main can return to the entry code? Where are the parameters? Where's array? Where's pointer as parameters? Where's my return address back to main? I want to be able to find every single one of those things and confirm that the stack pointer is indeed pointing to the right place with that one single halt instruction. That would be the first thing that I do. And then what am I going to do? What am I going to do next? I will take out a halt instruction and replace it with the usual sequence of instructions to return to the caller without doing a single thing. In other words, I'm not implementing anything here in the C code. I'm just going to say, let's pretend this function does not do anything because I just want to confirm that if I just do a single return, a simple return, it does return and the stack stays balanced. Okay, because with that, I am confirming that if the program doesn't work, it's because whatever code I put into Traverse, I don't have to suspect anything else in the program for you know, contributing to the error. Is that okay? <clears throat> so once that is done, then the first thing I'm gonna do is to say, let's just you know, not worry about line 14 to line 17. That looks kind of ugly to me. The first thing I'm just gonna do is to implement the conditional statement and put some stuff here, okay? Put a halt instruction in the then statement and then I would change the way I call <clears throat> in the C code. So in the C code, there are different ways of testing a program. The easiest, the, the first thing you should do is to pass a null pointer so that by the time we get into the function, it would get, it would try to return right away. And if we get to the halt instruction, in other words, if I replace this portion, line 14 to line 17, with, with a single halt instruction, and this is the way I call traverse in main, 
I should not get to the hold instruction because it's a null pointer, which means the condition of the conditional statement is not true, which means you know, I should never get to the hold instruction. So I would test that first, okay, is to make sure that I do not get to the hold instruction when I'm not supposed to get to the hold instruction. And then I would change my code just a little bit and you know, implement the second one and make sure that with that one, I do get to the hold instruction that we placed the, um, the, the, the then statement of the conditional statement. So I would check everything like that first, okay? Because then I am sure that the conditional statement is working. Because once I confirm that conditional, state is work, conditional statement is working, then I can worry about the rest, okay? And I would kind of not do the recursion call first. I would just take out the two recursive call on line 14 and line 17 and just deal with line 15 and 16 first. Because anything that is recursive makes it a little bit harder to work with and harder to verify. So I would just you know, take out line 14 and line 17 and just do line 15 and 16. So now the question is, but how do we know what the program is supposed to do? If I take out line 15, line 14 and line 17, you know, how do I know what the program is supposed to do? Can someone tell me how would you how would you figure out what the program is supposed to do if I were to change the C code a little bit like this? <clears throat> Any idea? I'll give you a hint. Starts with a G. There are only two tools that I use regularly that starts with a G. You use GDB. You compile the program in C with all the modifications, and then you observe what it is going to do with whatever array is pointing to. Array is a double pointer, which sounds like we never talked about a, you know, a double pointer. We talked about a single pointer, right? A double pointer is a pointer to a pointer to something. So in this, in this case, array as a parameter <clears throat> is a pointer to a pointer, and that pointer in return points to an unsigned A-bit integer. So that means you, know, you should be able to track it where it is exactly pointing to in C. So the, the, so the first thing you need to do to kind of understand this program is to run it in GDB first, and understand you know, how it works. Take out the recursion, get it to work without the recursion with all of these you know, alternative ways of starting to calling the program. I would just start with N5, okay, the address of N5, because you know, that case is not too recursive, even if you were to put in the recursive calls. So I would start with this one, which checks you know, whether the conditional statement is working or not, and then I would do this one, but with the modification of taking out all the recursive calls. If it does work without all the recursive calls, your assembly code is doing what the C code is doing, then I would put one back, okay, just to see whether your C code is matching what the assembly code is going to do. But ultimately, it is a match between what the C code is specifying and what your assembly code is doing as a quote copy of the C code. I can talk a little bit more about how to approach this program on Thursday, but you really need to get started as soon as possible with this one, because you know, um, <clears throat> I would say you know, um, first of all, take the sample programs that I wrote earlier today, use that as your study you know, material, and make sure you understand everything in that first, okay? Then the second thing is not even to start to code over here, okay? Forget about coding here. Run the program in C, and then just comment out some code, okay, and observe what the program is really doing. Once you understand that, then you can work on the assembly code, but do it step by step. Do we have any questions about this homework assignment? This is a programming assignment. You got a week to do it. I can extend it to a week and two days, but that is not going to be beneficial, okay, because you'll that means you know, we don't have a whole lot of time to really talk about the final exam, okay? <clears throat> and I can give you a sample final exam any day I want. I mean, if you guys are interested in that and you think you have time to prepare for that, I can give you, I can give that to you now. 
but I suspect you don't have time to do it because you really need to do this first because otherwise the sample exam, the final exam is not going to help at all. So I would definitely focus on this code between today and Thursday. Um, comment, make sure you understand the sample program that I wrote today. Go to the C code, okay? Try to find out what the C code does using a, G, a GDB or some kind of debugging environment. If you're used to Visual Studio or VS Code, use that, okay? But the key is to figure out how am I going to debug this program? How, what does it do? All right. <clears throat> so we are running out of time now. I cannot you know, extend too much further you know, with this. Um, you have today's lab. Um, today's lab does not even have an access code. So as soon as I <clears throat> make it visible, you should be able to get in. So let me double check on that. All right, where is, there we go. All right. So let me, so I, I, I'm giving you, I've already, I already sent you the traverse.zip file, which is the uh, starting point of the traverse homework assignment. <clears throat> and I will also give you uh, struct.c and struct.ttpasm, but I want to make sure that the lab is visible to you now. So that's what I'm doing right now. Yep, they should be visible to you, and there should be no access code for the one that's due today during the lab time. There are only like three questions. Most people got it done yesterday in 10 minutes or less. But the rest of the lab time, you know, I would suggest, you know, start to work on the longer, the programming assignment and start to, you know, comment the code. <clears throat> All right, so are there any questions before I stop the recorder? Because we are still recording, which is good. You know, that gives you a chance to review the material. I don't see any questions, so I will stop the recorder.